Hello, good evening everybody, or good afternoon for our friends in America. My name is Tobias Salate, I'm working for the Convention on Wetlands, and I'm be honored to be your moderator for this session where we are going to continue a dialogue which we actually started informally at uh, the COP23 in Bonn, and then had a meeting two years ago at the UN premises between different uh, environmental conventions or agreements two years ago in Bonn. So we're, we're happy to continue that dialogue here and being hosted here by the Peatland Pavilion and online. We are trying to do in two rounds short panel presentations and then be as interactive as possible to, to come back with questions and have the panelists and the public either here in the pavilion or online asking their question and interacting. So the first uh, round would be, we have three countries who explain us uh, about their national plans for peatlands, because it is about all about peatlands, who are bringing, which are bringing us here together, those incredible landscapes, and are bringing together the different environmental conventions also. But we listen first to three countries, and then move over to have three major conventions who will be here either online or in the pavilion discussing how they uh, continue to work together and maybe increase their exchanges and synergies. So I want to start first with a presentation by the Secretary General of the Convention on Wetlands, the Ramsar Convention, which by the way celebrates its 50 years jubilee this year because it was signed in 1971 in the city of Ramsar. We have our Secretary General, Ms. Ra Marda Rojas Urego, who is online and will uh, briefly tell us what the Convention on Wetland is been doing and has been doing for peatlands. Please, Marta. Thank you, Tobias, and welcome everybody. So I'm going to do some welcoming remarks. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all of you to, to be joining this event. Uh, which is dealing with a very, very important topic, which is investing and, on, and protecting and restoring peatlands for climate change. And this is extremely timely. Uh, uh, I have to say that uh, this COP has seen an unprecedented attention uh, to nature in addressing climate change. And this, of course, is, is very welcome because we know how important nature is to deal with climate change. And in that context, peatlands is ex are, are exceptionally important ecosystems, uh, as, as we will see during this discussion. Uh, but unfortunately, until recently, there has not been um, the level of international attention that these important ecosystems deserve. Uh, in fact, wetlands are very important components of the Earth's climate system, and they are crucial landscapes for climate mitigation and adaptation as well as other fundamental services, such as water security, on which we depend for everything uh, that we do in our lives. So uh, it's important to note that more than half of all the wetlands contain peat soils. So these, these are soils that accumulate organic matter over millennia under waterlogged conditions. So they are extremely rich in carbon and they cover about 3% of the Earth's uh, land surface, but they store 30% of land-based carbon. So 3%, 30% of the carbon. Uh, they actually store twice as much carbon than all the forests in the world. Uh, and, and these ecosystems include mires, bogs, fens, paramos, tundras, high altitude and subpolar peatlands. We also know that other type of wetlands, which are now known under the blue carbon name, uh, these are coastal wetlands, which include salt and tidal marshes, swamps, mangrove forests, and seagrass beds in shallow bays. They also accumulate carbon sediments up to 55 times faster than tropical forests. So it's really important to focus in this ecosystem to deliver climate change outcomes. And it is very urgent that we harness this work on these ecosystems in terms of the protection, restoration, wise use, so that we can deliver on the ambition of the Paris Agreement. And for this, uh, it's uh, crucial that wetlands are included in nationally determined contributions. Some countries have been doing this, but we need more so that we can reach uh, the Paris goals. 
Uh, as you might know, a recent UNEP report underlines the urgency of to triple finance for nature-based solutions, and wetlands are a very important ecosystem to deliver such solutions, including as concrete contributions uh, for the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And this convention, the Convention on Wetlands, now that we are going to be looking at how these different international agreements contribute to this agenda, the Convention on Wetlands is, is, is a key uh, framework in this regard uh, because it provides uh, the legal framework for 172 contracting parties that have joined the convention. And I'm very pleased to see that the country experiences that we are going to be hearing today uh, come from parties to the convention. So how have the parties uh, prioritized peatlands? Uh, so there, there, was, there have been some resolutions uh, by our conference of the parties on peatlands where parties have called for the inclusion of peatlands in NDCs and in greenhouse gas accounts. They have also requested the development of tools to support restoration as we will hear from Tobias during the event. Uh, but further, uh, the parties have taken upon themselves certain obligations uh, that are central to the convention, in particular, the establishment of wetlands of international importance. So we have a global network of more than 2,400 sites, of which 630 sites protect peatlands. So we have 630 sites already designated where peatlands are being conserved and used wisely and where efforts can be focused for their conservation. Uh, parties also develop data, knowledge, institutional capacity, management systems, policy and legal frameworks. And importantly, the parties of the convention also undertake national wetland inventories, which include peatlands, and they are reporting to their national reports on the extent of these ecosystems for the convention, but also for the sustainable development goals and in particular, the indicator 661. So this is really a, a very important foundation for action. And what we would like and what we see that is needed is how can we scale up this action under the convention, uh, but also how can we can collaborate and continue to strengthen the collaboration that we have with other agreements that also are involved in peatlands conservation. So we have been collaborating, but uh, we know that uh, it's really important to join efforts to strengthen our efficiency and to have maximum impact, impact as needed to achieve the ambition of the Paris Agreement, but also other important, important goals such as on biodiversity, on water security, food security, and the other benefits that this ecosystem provides. So I'm very pleased then to see that uh, we have these conventions also with us, that we, we can hear the efforts by national government, how these conventions can collaborate, and how can we also uh, harness alliances and collaborations and partnerships such as the Global Pitland Initiative uh, to collectively continue to push forward and, and get the level of attention and work that we need uh, to uh, protect wetlands. So I look forward to this discussion. I hope that we can, with this event, contribute to raising awareness. Uh, perhaps uh, you may be able to come up with some recommendations for the cover decision that is being negotiated uh, at this COP so that we can give the level of attention to this particular ecosystem. And also look forward to uh, also uh, seeing that we can identify concrete plans and actions that allow us to join efforts to scale the protection and restoration of this important ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marta Rojas Urrego, Secretary General of the Convention on Wetlands. We will now have three brief statements by three countries, Peru, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Germany. I'm wondering if Jose Alvarez Alonso from Peru is online. Yes. So Jose Alvarez here is the General Director of Biodiversity in the Ministry of Environment in Peru. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Bueno, me han dicho, uh, uh, good afternoon everyone from, from Peru. Me han dicho que puedo hablar en castellano, que es un idioma oficial de, la, Eso de vale, las Naciones Unidas. Vale bien, nosotros veni, vimos uh, la traducción de la, del, uh, de, del internet. Perfecto. Adelante. Entonces, uh, Entiendo que se puede hacer una pequeña presentación o tengo que... ¿Sí? ¿Se puede? Sí, 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 sí. Por, favor, por favor, por eh. favor. Correcto. Voy, 
voy a compartir la pantalla eh, para explicar, porque nos han puesto tres preguntas eh, sobre cómo es la situación, la importancia y el estatus de las turberas en el Perú. Aquí tenemos un mapa de la distribución de las principales turberas que tenemos en Perú. Están principalmente en la Amazonía, en el norte. Ahí tenemos una extensión de más de 6 millones de hectáreas de turberas que almacenan, según un cálculo preliminar, 3, 3 mil millones de toneladas de carbono. Esto significa más del 40% del carbono que tiene el Perú. Eh, otras zonas donde hay turberas son la zona andina, donde tenemos más de medio millón de turberas, que son bofedales, vamos a ver algunas fotos, que son humedales altoandinos que almacenan también eh, extraordinaria cantidad de carbono. En la costa hay un poquito menos. Estas son las eh, turberas altoandinas que tienen un manejo tradicional increíblemente eh, valioso porque estas comunidades altoandinas desde tiempos inmemoriales han no solo mantenido, sino incrementado la extensión de estas turberas a través de canales de saturación de agua porque significan la reserva de agua y de pasto para sus animales en épocas de sequía. Esto es importantísimo a la hora de recuperar porque ya hay una pérdida importante por migración, por cambio climático de estas turberas altoandinas que, como digo, tienen más de medio millón de hectáreas y tienen buena extensión de cantidad de turba. Estas son las turberas amazónicas, principalmente son pantanos de palmeras, donde eh, hay un uso no tan sostenible, ahora voy a explicar esto, pero hay un potencial enorme de generar riqueza e incentivos para su conservación. Solo de estos pantanos de palmeras tenemos más de 6.5 millones de hectáreas, donde la palmera predominante es el aguaje, mauritia flexuosa, que tiene unos frutos valiosísimos, hipernutritivos, riquísimos, que, que tienen una gran capacidad de in, ingresar al mercado, ya lo están comercializando varias empresas provenientes del manejo por comunidades. Y también hay fauna silvestre tan importante como el white lip peccary, que es eh, o, o, o el tapir, que son importantísimos para la seguridad alimentaria de las comunidades. Entre las amenazas podemos citar la extracción de turba en las andinas, no es muy masiva, pero sí es muy preocupante porque una vez destruida la, la turbera es muy difícil. También a veces hay incendios y degradación por sobrepastoreo. En la selva es la tala para cosecha de frutos de los aguajes. Parece una cosa trivial, pero es masiva esta tala. Calculamos que al año se calculan, se talan más de 200.000 palmeras para cosecha insostenible de frutos. Esto se está tratando de controlar enseñando a las comunidades a escalar las palmeras, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. En la costa la, el problema mayor es el cambio de uso. ¿Qué hacemos para conservar y restaurar las turberas? Promovemos la elaboración, por supuesto, de estudios e instrumentos, estamos haciendo mapeo de turberas, conducimos también, por supuesto, todo el tema de la gestión de los sitios Ramsar. Recientemente tenemos 14 sitios Ramsar en Perú, parte de ellos eh, protegen turberas, Recientemente fue declarado un nuevo sitio Ramsar en la costa del Perú y contribuimos con eh, la, estas convenciones internacionales con una mejor gestión de las turberas. Eh, varias de las turberas están en áreas protegidas, aquí tienen la lista de ellas, no les quiero cansar, pero están en, en, especialmente en la selva, es donde mayor extensión, en, protegidas en la Reserva Nacional Pacaya Samiria y otras reservas. ¿Qué promovemos? Una gestión fuera y dentro de las áreas protegidas, porque a, aproximadamente la mitad de las turberas en Perú están fuera de áreas protegidas, especialmente en el sitio Ramsar, abanico del Pastar, que tiene más de 2 millones de hectáreas. Entonces, ahí la estrategia es trabajar con comunidades locales, promoviendo bionegocios, especialmente con... Eh, las comunidades locales que aprovechan el fruto del aguaje y de otras palmeras a las que hemos ayudado a conectar con empresas que tienen interés en poner el mercado de estos productos. Entonces, esto es una alternativa muy interesante que puede crear incentivos para que no se talen las palmeras ni se haga cambio de uso. También estamos trabajando eh, en la identificación, el mapeo de estas turberas y estamos trabajando en una nueva medida de mitigación, una NDC de turberas amazónicas para 
ponerla sobre el tapete con la contribución nacionalmente determinada para disminuir su degradación y reducir las emisiones de carbono y estamos trabajando con multitud de actores en este tema. Este es entonces eh, el, el trabajo que estamos haciendo. Estamos eh, eh, trabajando con varias líneas, por ejemplo, con lineamientos para gestión de turberas, etcétera, y eh, hemos sacado recientemente, bueno, estamos trabajando en el índice de turberas y hemos sacado recientemente una nueva norma para mitigar eh, la, 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 la emisión de carbono eh, y la gestión sostenible de turberas, un, una gestión multisectorial de turberas. Esto sería todo. De momento no quiero cansarles porque creo que ya me pasé de mi tiempo. Muchísimas gracias. Many thanks. I'm inviting those in the pavilion, but also those online. If you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A. Those in the pavilion, keep them for afterwards. After this uh, first very interesting presentation from a very peat-rich country, Peru, uh, between the Amazon and the Andes and the Pacific, I'm inviting our second uh, speaker from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Jean-Jacques Bambuta, who is the coordinator of the Peatland Management Unit in the Ministry of Environment. I'm happy that he is physically with us in the pavilion. And uh, please, you have a few minutes. Uh, you can do it from there. Or do, do you have a power pipe? Yeah. No. There then, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm again back in uh, this pavilion. Uh, after the good job that uh, we made yesterday, we are again there. As uh, I've done for my first presentation, I will go ahead in French. Et donc, euh, mesdames et messieurs, je suis encore de retour dans ce beau pavillon. Je voudrais, pour l'instant, euh, pour ne pas vous prendre beaucoup de temps et laisser le temps à la réflexion, euh, réfléchir un peu à haute voix avec vous sur les synergies possibles afin de pouvoir conserver les tourbières. Depuis quelques jours, nous sommes en train de signaler ici que les tourbières de la République démocratique du Congo sont pratiquement à 99% intactes parce que inondées et euh, aussi d'accès difficile. Mais nous, en tant que pays, nous n'allons pas attendre à ce que les tourbières là soient attaquées euh, euh, avant que nous puissions nous lancer dans une démarche de la conservation des tourbières. Bien sûr, à ce stade en République démocratique du Congo, nous ne parlons pas encore de la restauration parce que nous n'en sommes pas là. Il s'agit d'un écosystème qui est euh, intact à, 90, euh, à 99%, comme je viens de le dire. Alors, notre combat maintenant, c'est comment maintenir ces tourbières dans leur état originel afin que cet écosystème soit capable de pouvoir remplir sa fonctionnalité écologique. C'est ça le, le, notre combat de chaque jour. Pourquoi c'est un combat Parce que j'avais, euh, dans mes précédentes présentations, parlé du contexte qui est celui de la RDC. Et donc, vous avez là un pays qui est caractérisé par une interconnexion des ressources naturelles. Là où vous avez du, de, des tourbières, il se pourrait qu'il y ait d'autres ressources. Par exemple, en dessous des tourbières que nous avons dans les provinces du bassin central, il y aurait du pétrole ou il y a du pétrole en dessous des tourbières que nous avons dans la, notre partie qui est connectée à l'Atlantique, donc les tourbières de mangrove, là aussi, il y a du pétrole, parce que dans cette zone, il y a déjà une exploitation du pétrole. Et donc, vous voyez que les responsabilités du pays sont énormes en termes de choix à pouvoir opérer entre, d'un côté, la conservation et, de l'autre côté, l'exploitation. Mais qu'à cela ne tienne, nous avons aussi l'histoire qui nous enseigne euh, par rapport à ce genre de, de, de dilemmes dans lesquels se trouve la République démocratique du Congo. En fouillant un peu dans l'histoire, j'ai euh, découvert un enseignement qui m'a fait rire. Vous le connaissez euh, tous. C'est ce qu'on appelle le syndrome hollandais, où la Hollande a découvert du pétrole dans son sous-sol et a commencé à exploiter ce pétrole. Malheureusement, le, 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 euh, même si la, la rente pétrolière était là, mais l'amélioration 
de, de, de vécu des de, de communautés ou des populations n'a pas suivi. Il se pourrait que nous aussi, en choisissant par exemple de, mettre de, de laisser de côté la conservation et d'aller vers l'exploitation de ressources qui seraient peut-être en dessous des tourbières, que nous puissions être butés à ce problème. Déjà que nous avons des minéraux qui sont exploités et, et pour lesquels les retombées ne profitent pas suffisamment à, aux populations. Alors maintenant, que faire C'est là où je reviens à notre préoccupation de, de, de cette session qui est en fait les synergies qu'il va falloir identifier entre les dynamiques nationales ou la dynamique nationale des tourbières ou entre la politique nationale des tourbières et les conventions. Alors, il est vrai que les tourbières font partie euh, des zones humides. Et donc déjà à ce niveau-là, à l'international, nous avons beaucoup d'enseignements euh, euh, à base desquels nous pouvons fonder notre politique. Mais pour ne pas aller euh, euh, très loin, nous savons que, en ce qui concerne par exemple la biodiversité, les zones à tourbières, en ce qui concerne la République démocratique du Congo, sont des zones qui foisonnent vraiment d'une biodiversité indescriptible. Il est important de ce fait de pouvoir maintenir euh, euh, cet écosystème dans son état naturel. D'où le développement des synergies qui doit être fait entre toutes ces grandes conventions et aussi, et aussi pardon, la dynamique nationale. Là, c'est ce qui concerne les conventions. Mais déjà, ici, euh, 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 dans ce pavillon, on a évoqué une, une, une déclaration qui est signée entre euh, euh, trois pays. Donc, nous avons l'Indonésie, la République démocratique du Congo et, euh, et la République du Congo. Là, je suis en train de parler de la déclaration de, de, de Brazzaville. Je pense que, avant que nous ne puissions regarder ce qui est dit dans les autres conventions sur les tourbières, il est important que nous puissions déjà mettre en œuvre notre propre convention, j'allais dire mini-convention, qui est la nôtre. Je parle de la déclaration de, de Brazzaville. Et pour finir, nous sommes dans ce beau pavillon qui est celui du GPI. Plusieurs acteurs, plusieurs chercheurs, plusieurs intervenants et aussi les dynamiques nationales font partie de cette plateforme. D'une façon ou d'une autre, cette plateforme peut même se constituer en une sorte de convention sans pouvoir le dire exactement comme ça. Et donc, il est important que l'on puisse déjà identifier, au sein même de la plateforme, quelles sont les expériences en termes de conservation de, et protection des tourbières, des uns qui peuvent servir euh, à éclairer les politiques ou les actions des autres. Je pense qu'il y a un petit dynamisme qu'il va falloir donner à, à, à toutes ces synergies qui sont les nôtres au sein de la plateforme pour que, euh, la conservation de tourbières aille de l'avant et que cet écosystème puisse être maintenu dans l'état de pouvoir euh, 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 profiter et euh, euh, contribuer à l'atténuation du climat. Pour ce qui concerne la République démocratique du Congo, pour finir, nous avons euh, euh, réussi à pouvoir inclure euh, euh, les tourbières dans la contribution nationale déterminée, mais il reste encore beaucoup de choses à faire beaucoup de choses à faire, notamment en termes d'études, afin que nous puissions avoir des chiffres plus exacts qui vont permettre de pouvoir identifier des activités bien porteuses d'opportunités. Mais je pense qu'il est important que nous puissions réfléchir sur la manière dont toutes ces conventions que nous connaissons, mais aussi toutes les dynamiques que nous sommes en train de monter, vont réellement contribuer à la conservation des tourbières. Voilà, mesdames et messieurs, la petite réflexion que je voudrais faire à haute voix avec vous. J'ai dit, je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. À M. Jean-Jacques Patumba, Rambuta. Our third country speaker who will also be online is Thomas Graner from Germany. He is the vice president of the Federal Agency for Nature Conservation in Germany. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Hello, everybody from Berlin. I'm very pleased that I have the opportunity to introduce the experience and actions for peatland restoration in Germany to you. Um, the German Federal Agency for Nature Conservation, um, BFN, has supported the peatland synergy process together with the Secretariat of the Ramsar Convention, GPI, and others for several years now by facilitating workshops. And we are committed to pursuing this meaningful um, topic in, in the future. Maybe let's go to the next slide. To be honest, um, when it comes to peatlands in Germany, 
we have not done good in the past. Um, 92% of our peat soils are drained or degraded. Uh, more than half of them are used as grasslands and uh, another 19% as arable land. Greenhouse grass emissions from drained peat soils amount to almost 7% of our total national emissions. That's really a big part of our national greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I think this figure highlights the importance and urgency to restore peatlands for nature conservation and climate change at the same time. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, the, the BFN as a small nature conservation agency in Germany um, has tried a lot to, to focus on that uh, activities for peatlands. Um, for example, my agency supports the restoration and conservation in, uh, we call it um, large scale conservation projects um, where we can also fund this thing. And we try to develop scientific basis for pursuing synergies between biodiversity and climate objectives for peatlands at the same time. Um, we have several projects, uh, scientific projects, um, where we tested um, restoration approaches and try to identify the most suitable measures in terms of emission reductions, restoration of typical bog vegetation, nutrient control, etc. And we try to provide technical support for the development of the new German peatland strategy. And let's go to the next slide. Um, because there is some hope um, that, we, that we will do better in Germany in the future. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, the Environment Ministry was successfully publishing our first national peatland protection strategy. Um, uh, the strategy aims uh, to remain healthy peatlands as well as to foster the large scale restoration or re-wetting of our drained peat soils with the goal of reducing annual greenhouse gas emissions by 5 million tons of CO2 equivalent by 2030. So you can see in those numbers that um, um, uh, restoring peatlands can be a big part of climate change. Um, the overall approach in our strategy um, is based on voluntary measures in cooperation with our land users and landowners. Um, and I think there is also one small part of our problem. Um, we, we do need to get access um, to peatlands that we want to restore. And this is one of our main problems. As you can see, um, we have also funds available um, the finance, peatland restoration and reduction of peat use uh, will be 330 million euros by 2020. That is quite an amount of money. And um, as far as I can see it, it's, it's really a good start um, in order to um, restore our uh, drained peatlands. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, what, what do we need? I think we, we still need coordination. Uh, we need coordination between the different MEAs um, in order to, to lift synergies and uh, to maximize uh, our work and get benefit from those synergies. I think it is really um, um, int very, very um, important that we get um, more technical guidance and support um, for all of us, that we come close together and uh, learn from the experience we have made in different countries like we do it today and hopefully in the future. And I think it's always important um, for uh, multilateral environmental agreements that are connected to biodiversity to, to stress and emphasize the, the close link between the biodiversity loss and on the one hand and on the other hand, um, the, the climate change process with that which we need. And here, when it comes to peatland, I think we have the chance um, to really find synergies across different MEAs. And uh, from my side and the side of my government, we would like to, to support this process in the future. Thank you very much. Agency for Nature Conservation. Uh, while the audience here in the pavilion and online 
uh, can think about those synergies between the different conventions. And before we will hear the other convention, let me briefly show you what the Convention on Wetlands has just published two weeks ago. Uh, I have a small PowerPoint, and uh, that was actually prepared by our scientific and technical review, review panel and a specific task force on peatlands, where Professor Hans Joosten, who is in the pavilion here, was the main author, together with other peatland specialists across the world. Uh, it was mentioned before by our Secretary General that uh, the Convention on Wetland has a resolution which encourages its parties to designate Ramsar site wetlands of international importance because of their carbon sequestration capacity, in addition to biodiversity arguments and water management arguments. Uh, and then during the last year or so, we have really come up with uh, quite urgent messages. I think the feeling here in, at Glasgow is that it is really time now to move forward, and therefore the messages are clear and maybe a little bit stark but based on the scientific uh, knowledge and understanding. First of all, it was said, keep the carbon stored in the peatlands where they are still intact, the mires which are still accumulating carbon. But then, and uh, the German example is quite speaking for that, we should probably increasingly focus on drained peatlands because they are responsible for a lot of 4% of all anthropogenic emissions. And, uh, then we are addressing the methane issues, which has been addressed on a wider level last week here at Glasgow. Uh, Rewetting may provide some carbon peaks, which you see in that graph, which is taken from our policy brief, but methane peaks are short-lived, and the earlier we're doing the rewetting, that's the blue uh, uh, line there, the more chance do we have to keep the temperature at a lower level. If you wait longer, then it may not be able to stay with the same temperature. Uh, we have produced four uh, policy uh, instruments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one is a recommendations for policymakers, which does exactly say this, no further uh, expansion of agriculture or forestry into still remaining untouched peatlands. Uh, the focus on those drained peatlands to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because if we want to get to the net zero, we, we do probably have to eventually re-wet, restore all degraded peatlands. That is a huge task. It has been estimated of needing about 20,000 square kilometers. That's a small country huh? per year. This is obviously a very huge task, but every square kilometer counts. So even doing little and doing it rather earlier than later helps. So these are the stark messages from the policy brief. Next slide, please. For the uh, more technical people, we have produced a global handbook for peatland rewetting and restoration, which uh, does analyze how to set your goals, how to make sure that you can monitor and evaluate if you are at that attaining your objectives and things like this. This is a link to a huge literature reference uh, where the, the underlying science can be found. And the third uh, 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 tool, next slide please, is a briefing note for practitioners. Yes, this one. This is for those people who actually go and do the job inside the peatlands with the their hands in the peat and their feet in the Wellington boots. And uh, then there is another briefing note, which is not now shown here, also on blue carbon. Uh, our Secretary General said before, obviously underneath salt marshes, underneath mangroves, underneath seagrass bed is also accumulating peat. And that also counts in the carbon sink accounting for uh, nationally determined contributions or national pathways. And just the last point, and we will hear more about this, uh, the, there is now a global peatland assessment starting, and later on Diana Kopanski from uh, the GPI will certainly tell us more. So I'm looking at the audience here, I, and uh, also on questions which came in. 
uh, before we are moving on to the short presentations by the other conventions, there was one uh, question coming in. If Thomas Grana from Germany, can you comment on the Bavarian goal on revetting only one third of their peatlands until 2050? What would be a mechanism, in your opinion, to expand those uh, regional efforts? If, uh, yes. Yes, please. Um, I think we have to combine all our re regional efforts in Germany and the national uh, effort. And I think the, the federal government and the local governments, they have to come together with the national strategy for peatland rewetting. And I think that's, that's one, one main political issue where we can combine our efforts and the, the national goal is set. Um, it is set in the way that uh, we want to reduce our emissions which come from peatlands and we will fund the re-wetting with those 330 million euros which will go in the regions and I think all the regions and all our federal state will contribute to it. So um, we have different goals on different levels but the national level and the national targets are clear and they are set. Thank you for your question. Does uh, Jose Alonso has any remark also? No? No. Okay, thanks. thanks. Then I suggest, because we are running uh, behind time a little bit, we are inviting the representative from the other conventions. Maybe we're starting with David Cooper, the Deputy Executive Secretary from the Convention on Biodiversity. I'm happy that he is with us. He will be followed by then uh, uh, presentations online from the Convention to Combat Desertification and by uh, somebody coming over from the Climate Change Convention. But please now, David Cooper from the Biodiversity Convention. Thank you very much. Does this work? Yeah. This good? So, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Ramsar Convention and others for convening this important discussion here. I think this issue of peatlands is, is one of the best examples of where we need synergy, coherent action across the convention. So across the conservation-oriented convention, CMS, the World Heritage Convention, uh, Ramsar, uh, of course, and also across the real conventions. Um, the, the climate convention, the convention to combat land uh, uh, um, land degradation, and of course the CBD, which falls into into both camps. Um, we've seen from the examples presented just now how important the conservation of peatlands and the restoration of peatlands through rewetting, uh, among other things, is so important for climate change. How it's an essential part of reaching or staying within 1.5 degrees. It's also, of course, important for many other ecosystem services. So for combating land degradation directly in situ where you are restoring the, the peatlands, but also, of course, um, downstream in that, that, that peatlands will often then protect uh, against um, Floods, flooding downstream, erosion downstream, protect water quality as well as regulating uh, water quantity uh, downstream. And, and therefore, it's also really important for climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction. It's also an extremely important habitat in its own right. And we see quite a diversity of peatlands if we look around the globe from the areas, for example, here in the Scottish uplands, the uplands of other parts of the United Kingdom, um, across areas, as we've just heard in, in Germany, including areas that have been drained um, now for, for, for agriculture, but are now being restored. Uh, of course, the vast areas across um, uh, Russia and Canada, the tropical forests of Indonesia that we, we know so much about, tropical forests also in other parts of the world, such as, such as Peru. And then other very distinct ecosystems, such as the paramo of 
uh, the Andes, the Colombia, uh, Ecuador, uh, and neighboring countries, uh, one of the most vulnerable ecosystems for uh, climate change coming under the combined effects, actually, of climate change and, and, and land degradation, but really important for biodiversity, unique assemblages of species, and really important um, as water towers of providing clean water, for example, for major cities like Quito, Bogota, uh, and, and other places. So it really is a, a no-brainer that we need to invest in con conserving peatlands and, and, in, and in restoring them. In the fifth edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook, we uh, described something we called the sustainable freshwater transition. This builds actually on work done, um, done by, by others um, uh, uh, and through FAO and the Ramsar Convention and, and others, but looking at how peatlands can be part of this issue of maintaining habitats, protecting the environmental flows, the flows of water, in our, in our waterways and um, contributing to water quality as well as to freshwater biodiversity, which is the most threatened um, aspect of, of biodiversity. I'd just like to note that the um, CBD has a joint work program with the, the Ramsar Convention. The current work plan runs um, run until 2020, we're now um, looking to update and extend that, um, linked to the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, which will be considered at the second part of CBD COP15, which will take place in Kunming, China, in April, May next year. Um, we hope that the various goals and targets in that framework on uh, protecting areas, on comprehensive spatial planning on integrating the values of biodiversity uh, in e in e across economies, on removing uh, harmful subsidies, will play an important role also in, in contributing to the effort to, to protect peatlands. We also look forward very much to the, to the global um, peatlands assessment. Some of the figures we've just heard are um, are quite striking, um, but clearly this message that the sooner we act, the better, the sooner we begin acting, the better. Uh, indeed, the biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, they are both equally urgent. We need strong actions this decade um, in order actually to see the benefits this decade, but also over the longer term to 2050. So um, I think I've run out of time, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and we look forward to continuing our collaboration with Ramsar and with all of the other conventions and organizations involved uh, in these initiatives. Thank you. Yes, we can applause as he is with us in the pavilion. Um, we've heard already interesting aspects the new global framework for biodiversity to be adopted next spring. Maybe peatlands can be part of it. I'm giving you a few ideas for the discussions we may have afterwards, and also obviously uh, inviting the, the representatives from the three countries who spoke before. We are now trying to get the, the Deputy Executive Secretary from the Convention to Combat Desertification, Ms. Tina Birnpili, on screen, she has prepared a video, and I hope that we can air that one. Distinguished delegates, dear colleagues and friends, peatlands are the world's natural infrastructure, which provide water and food, mitigate climate, and protect us from droughts and floods. But once drained, they become drylands and release vast amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. The sustainable development target on land degradation neutrality is a practical framework that aims at keeping land in balance so that in net terms, things will not get worse. When it comes to peatlands, it's about rewetting previously degraded peat sites while also working to avoid or reduce the risk of peatland degradation. 
To date, 127 countries have expressed the political will to join the global mission to restore vast amounts of land to achieve land degradation neutrality. They have committed to restore about 450 million hectares of degraded land. Nearly one third of the countries identified wetland conservation and restoration measures as a priority, while 15 of them had a direct target or no net loss of wetlands and peatlands. Reversing peatland degradation is a priority for some countries in the land degradation neutrality targets, but also in their obligations under the Paris Agreement. Policies which protect, restore, and sustainably use peatlands, investments which support large-scale rewetting of drained peat sites, and technological solutions can lead to net zero carbon dioxide emissions from peatlands by 2050. This ambition will require action now and at all levels. Although the United Nations Convention to Combat the Certification focuses primarily on drylands, connectivity across all ecosystems in different climatic zones is critical. Failing ecosystem services in one region have cascading effects on the productive potential of other ecosystems, and hence on the communities which depend on those ecosystems. Our convention supports countries in diagnosing the health of the land resources. The ongoing monitoring and reporting cycle will reveal the global and regional trends in land cover, in biomass productivity, in soil carbon, in different types of lands. Those data will inform national and global actions to achieve land degradation neutrality. The global mechanism of the convention supports 56 countries around the world to design projects and mobilize resources to implement the national land degradation neutrality targets. Peatland conservation can be part in these national projects and programs. Our participation today in this important event is a signal that nothing can be achieved if we work in isolation. Many environmental agreements can join forces through their own policy frameworks to protect and restore peatlands. Working together from our respective mandates, we can better support countries in the challenging task to restore 2 million hectares of drained peatland annually until 2050 to comply with the Paris Agreement. I wish you a productive discussion. I look forward to the outcomes of the side event and I would like to thank you for inviting us. I don't know if you're hearing it. I'm encouraging the panelists online uh, and all other participants online to put their question, if they have so, into the Q&A, because they will appear here and we can uh, bring them forward to the panelists. I think as we are missing uh, still the participants from the Climate Change Convention, we would, I would like to, in, is, oh, he is here, great. Dirk Nimitz from the Secretariat of the Climate Change Framework Convention. So please, uh, we are listening to you. Thank you, thank you, Tobias. Um, is that working okay? Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank my, my previous speakers for giving very good examples from Peru, from Germany, and from the, the Democratic Republic of Congo of what is being done in peatlands and how important they are for climate change. It's much more relevant than me citing global numbers. And also my fellow speakers from the sister conventions, David and Tina, for covering extensively already the cooperation and synergies so I'm I have time to focus on the Climate Change Convention. And of course, in the UNFCC process, all terrestrial ecosystems are recognized as important for adaptation to climate change and for mitigation of climate change. And 
um, as well as in the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. So all have commitment-related articles that refer to forests and other terrestrial ecosystems and with that also to peatlands um, for parties to take action on climate change and peat. More than 80% of the UNFCC parties have done so in the recent NDCs submitted and they are committed towards achieving the goals of Paris, including with land. And equally, many countries have included land and forests as part of their adaptation measures against the impacts of climate change. So it's an important aspect of our convention. And land and climate interact in complex ways through changes in forcing and multiple biophysical and biogeochemical bio feedbacks across different spatial and temporal scales. Agriculture, forestry, and other land use, as we call the sector AFOLU, is a significant net source of emissions, contributing 23% of anthropogenic emissions. According to the IPCC, of the land degradation processes, deforestation, increasing wildfires, degradation of peat soils, and permafrost thawing contribute most to climate change through the release of greenhouse gases and the reduction in land carbon sinks following deforestation. Hence, the degradation of peatlands or the unsustainable management con contributes substantially to GHG emissions. On the other hand, globally, land also serves as a large CO2 sink, which was estimated for the period 2008 to 2017 to be nearly 30% of total anthropogenic emissions. But for us, it's important not only to say it's an important thing and we want to take action and there is speeches and there are commitments and there are pledges to do something, but it's also important to follow up with measurements and see what is the real effect. How far does this help to reach the Paris Climate Goal? So we are um, very focused also on the follow-up and on showing what is being done and on the transparency of policies, actions and reporting and the review that has always been a key pillar of the climate change process to quantify what is actually happening in the atmosphere and in emissions. So the Framework Convention recognized the importance of transparency in order to achieve its ultimate objective. And parties demonstrate transparency through their reporting to the Convention, to the Kyoto Protocol, and soon to the Paris Agreement. The enhanced transparency framework of the Paris Agreement builds upon and enhances the existing MRV arrangements of the Convention. The information and data that will be reported by countries under the Paris Agreement will serve to provide a clear understanding of climate change actions being taken and will help towards each country tracking progress in its meeting of the actions and commitments identified in its NDC. It was the whole system was established and is being established here at this COP to build mutual trust and confidence among countries and to promote effective implementation of climate actions. As part of the reporting and review processes of the Convention and the Paris Agreement, countries report their GHG inventory as well as policies and measures on mitigation and adaptation. Land use, forest, and with that also peat is one of the reporting categories. According to the categorization, peatlands are included in the wetlands category. IPCC methodologies only consider managed wetlands or managed peatlands in which the water table is either drained or raised. Developed countries with peatlands, for example, where extractions take place for energy, have been reporting this land use in their GHG inventory for a long time. Developed countries are beginning to consider reporting on peatlands in their inventories as well. And in fact, for developed countries with extensive peatlands and where deforestation is a problem, um, these countries have included these as part of their reporting on the forest sector already, such as uh, when reporting their Red Plus implementation. Where are the synergies? One of the key ingredients necessary for meeting the requirements on the enhanced transparency framework and hence fulfilling the objective of the Paris Agreement is strong and effective national institutional arrangements. National capacities, capacities will need to be developed and built. All interested stakeholders at national, regional, local, communities, technical, research and educational experts will need to get together and get involved to provide the necessary data and information for transparent reporting. Up-to-date data and information as part of enhancing transparency are essential to allow for making informed decisions and developing relevant policies and identifying the most appropriate climate actions. Land use and forest monitoring systems and networks could facilitate the generation of such necessary data and information for transparent reporting.
If peatlands are a critical ecosystem of a country, countries would need to look at how it can incorporate the relevant stakeholders working or dependent on peat in such institutional arrangements to allow for the sharing of data and information for reporting purposes and tracking of progress towards the NDC. To facilitate transparent reporting by countries on their climate-related measures and actions, the Secretariat works and collaborates closely with other international or UN organizations, both the Rio Convention Secretariats, but also FAO, UNDP and UNEP, agencies that are working on the ground with national technical teams. The Secretariat also coordinates and provides training and capacity building in relation to transparency and reporting to both review experts and to national experts. The UNFC process needs more trained experts, and as the, the Paris Agreement will need um, to meet reporting requirements from a much larger number of countries on a regular basis, and we look forward to working together with all the other conventions, with all the other UN organizations, and with everyone else in the room, and in particular also in the future with the, more closely with the Ramsar Convention on this matter. Thank you, Tobias, and I hope I wasn't too long. Thank you. Dirk Nemitz, very much for that very substantial contribution. Uh, as you said, you are the team leader for AFOLU, afforestation, agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. I think we've heard a lot of very agreement that we work, we are in this together. And that was mentioned by David Cooper also when we met in Bonn two years ago, there were other conventions under UNEP there as well. Uh, and they are certainly also part of, of the, the group. Uh, as uh, David uh, probably has to leave, I would encourage uh, the countries maybe to ask him a question or whoever from the participants who has a question before we ask Diana Kopanski uh, from the Global Peatland Initiative under UNEP to uh, tell us how the Global Peatland Initiative could react to those needs of the country. But maybe a, a very concrete question to those con three countries who were presenting their strategies before. Do you feel you are sufficiently served by the conventions you have signed? Uh, can you tell us about gaps, where we could do better, where we could do different or more? Now it's an opportunity to come forward. Uh, maybe uh, Jean-Jacques Bambupa from, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, as he is sitting in front of me here in the pavilion, and then the two others from Germany and Peru afterwards. Je pense que euh, lorsque ces conventions, toutes ces conventions ont été signées, les tourbières n'avaient pas encore suffisamment d'ampleur comme nous l'avons euh, maintenant. Voilà pourquoi le besoin maintenant euh, de pouvoir développer des synergies. Maintenant, je sais que dans chaque pays, chaque convention a un point focal. Nous, ce que nous faisons en République démocratique du Congo, c'est d'approcher ce point focal. Par exemple, je sais qu'il y a un point focal euh, qui s'occupe de la biodiversité, il y en a un autre qui s'occupe de, 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 du Ramsar. Il y a un autre qui s'occupe de la convention en rapport avec la désertification. Donc, tout cela, lorsque nous allons commencer à élaborer la politique nationale des tourbières, nous allons les approcher afin que leurs éléments soient pris en compte. Donc, c'est ça, en fait, la, la synergie à laquelle nous sommes en train de penser. Merci. Are interacting sufficiently amongst themselves. Uh, do we have uh, any feedback from Peru or Germany? I mean, I think either Jose Alvarez or Thomas Grana to react. Yes. yes. Uh, I, yeah. Jose, okay. Please. Go ahead. Please. Jose. Jose. Yeah. Jose. Thank you very much. Favor. Ya, yeah. eh, nosotros tenemos eh, grandes esperanzas en que en la COP de biodiversidad que tendrá lugar en China en, a fines de abril y principios de mayo se apruebe metas ambiciosas en conservación tanto marina como terrestre. Se habla ya mucho de 30 por 30 en la meta 3 y eh, nosotros tenemos previsto eh, usar esta herramienta en la Convención de Diversidad Biológica para proteger con otras modalidades de conservación basadas en áreas, como mencioné antes, en alianza con todos los actores, conservar esas más de dos millones de hectáreas 
de turberas que todavía tenemos sin protección efectiva en la Amazonía. Eh, esto creo que va a ser una buena oportunidad de sinergia entre las convenciones, la de cambio climático, porque ahí está el mayor stock de carbono que tiene el Perú, que todavía no tiene una figura, tiene, es, es sitio Ramsar, pero todavía no tiene una figura nacional que le provea suficiente mecanismo de implementación para protegerlo efectivamente de las amenazas. Hay varios proyectos, incluyendo una carretera, incluyendo una línea de transmisión que van a poner muy en riesgo esta región tan rica en biodiversidad, en carbono y en recursos para las comunidades. Entonces, creo que va a ser una oportunidad extraordinaria de sinergia entre todas las convenciones y esperamos que eh, esta COP de diversidad biológica eh, sustente justamente esta High Ambition Coalition, que, que somos parte del Perú, y, y esperamos que, que se cumpla la, la meta eh, aspiracional del 30 por 30 en, para todos los países del mundo. Gracias. Gracias a usted. Maybe Thomas Graner. Yeah, very broad, briefly and shortly. I think all the multilateral environmental agreements, um, they are important for us. Um, one, one basic thing is, of course, uh, to, to provide technical support and uh, to, to collect new knowledge uh, on how we can proceed in the future and to provide this knowledge globally for each and everybody. Um, and on the other hand, I think it's always important for the um, when it comes to enforcement on the national level that you have uh, a political basis, a background where you can rely on. And, and also for a country like Germany, it is important um, to have a convention on wetlands in the background in order to come up with a strategy plan what we can do about the, the German peatlands. So it is important to have on the one hand the technical part and on the other hand the political backing that can help you in the national processes to come to progress. Thank you. We've heard quite clearly the second part of the CBD COP15 in China in next spring seems to be an important milestone. Maybe David Cooper, you want to react on this opportunity? Yeah, so I, I, I think you can look at this in, in, in two aspects. First, looking at the, the, the targets that are set, because that will provide the framework for the, the next decade and, 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 and beyond. Um, so getting those targets right. So if you look at the 30 by 30, for instance, of course, the area is important, but more important than you know, square kilometers is the quality of those areas, both in terms of biodiversity and in terms of the ecosystem services that they, that they provide. So making sure that they're truly outcome oriented, not only looking at, at, uh, at, at area itself. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, that those targets on protected areas or on other effective conservation measures are complemented by a broader landscape approach. Um, not everything can be a protected area, so we need to look at how we manage the, the, whole, the whole landscape. Then, of course, beyond that, there are targets that look in at the underlying drivers, and that's really where that drives change, um, particularly, for example, the incentive structures, um, uh, subsidies. So, you know, one, one important action is is to make sure that those targets are the right targets. The other, of course, is to make sure we put in place means for implementation, financial, technical, that can enable quick, quick implementation, so quick nationalization, if you like, of this global target, translation into national targets, maybe a little bit akin to the INDCs, and then quick implementation. Um, and of course, in doing that, it'll be really important that we're coherent across the conventions. Um, so that we're, um, you know, I mean, we are divided up into these different conventions, but really we're looking at common issues, um, uh, common problems. There are common drivers and there are multiple benefits. So let's, you know, we will, it's important that we, that we work together that in implementing all of these 
actions on preserving and conserving peatlands, for example, we're looking at the guidance from the Climate Convention, the Land Degradation Convention, the, the CBD, Ramsar Convention, and so on. Thank you. So uh, when we had a more technical meeting in May 2019 on the island of Film, invited by the German agency, we did already sketch out the kind of the milestones. That was before the pandemic, so, but the CBD COP15 was there quite clearly. I see Thomas Grana wants to react, please. Yeah, just a quick remark. Um, when, we, when, we, when we look on peatlands, it becomes quite clear that um, only to, to stress on protected areas is not enough. Of course, we need a lot of protected areas. We need more protected areas, good protected areas. But when it comes, for example, to restoration of peatlands in Germany, this is not a question of protected areas. Those are areas which are agriculture land. And so we have the difficulties that we go into a kind of area where people um, work on this area. So, And this is another quality or, or another political issue. How can we get access to agriculture land, making it a better land for biodiversity and climate change in the future. So the, the approach of protected areas will not be sufficient in that part um, in, in Germany. So we have to be clear that we need protected areas, but that we also need to stress on areas where agriculture and other human uses are already in place. Thank you. As I said before, the Ramsar Convention clearly states in its uh, outputs that two weeks ago that focusing also on the degraded peatlands is important. Now I have a question from the pavilion, please, if uh, uh, you will get a microphone. Brief briefly introduce yourself for the online people. Hello, uh, I'm Hyona from the South Korea. I work for the German organization in South Korea, especially North and South Korea. And we talk about the multilateral environmental cooperation. But in South Korea, if we work for the one land conservation, coastal area covered by, covered by Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries. Inland one is covered by Ministry of Environment. And Aflu is managed by Korea Forest Service. It's already, we have a national target under the climate change conversion. But as I explained, we, is a, is a, I'm not sure it's not only the South Korea case, maybe the other countries is a similar. We talk about the multilateral environment, environmental comfort, uh, convers, conservation, but still, at the national level, it's very difficult to the, make a multilateral, ministry level con, uh, cooperation. How can we make a balance between the its ministry level to get the national target and also the global target. If you give any idea or tip, it will be helpful to my future step. Thank you. Is there anybody among the panelists who would like to respond to this, uh, the experience in Peru or in Germany or by other conventions, how to cooperate? Uh, Ramza always is confronted to this issue also as we are taking wetlands in an integrative sense. There are the inland ones, there are the coastal ones, including the coastal marine ones, uh, blue carbon, but also coral reefs. Uh, but often under CBD, this is inland and something is marine. So how can we bridge that gap? Or is there a gap or is it simply needs more exchange? speaking with each other, <laughs> with the colleague in the next ministry or the next door. Maybe we can uh, now invite Diana Kopanski. She is uh, with UNEP and coordinates the Global Peatlands Initiative. She has been uh, listening carefully and uh, maybe she wants to react. Uh, how could uh, the Global Peatlands Initiative best uh, serve those needs in the different countries or how it has already started? serving those need in a number of selected countries amongst them two are, are with us, DRC and Peru. Please, Diana. 
Thank you so much, Tobias, and thanks so much, everyone, for sharing. I wanted also, before I sort of jump into a little bit of a what we've been doing, um, to react to that. I think this is exactly the challenge that many countries are facing, um, what our South Korean um, colleague has asked for. And this is exactly why we suggested that peatlands be the perfect experiment zone. Uh, not only do peatlands cover a very small surface area of the world, but they're so critically important for so many of the multilateral environmental agreements. And although we do recognize that some countries have more challenging situations um, with mo many and most of their peatlands converted, we also need to urgently uh, work out um, through this collaboration how we can build up the multilateral environmental agreement layers to serve the needs of um, large scale peatlands like the Congo Basin. So let me just dive in a little bit here. We have been discussing and appreciating the, the engagement of uh, a number of multilateral environmental agreement secret secretariats. And as UNEP and as the Global Peatlands Initiative, I have the um, privilege of being a, a neutral broker to bring together parties to discuss how can we um, speak for peatlands. We speak as UNEP for the environment and the Global Peatland Initiative speaks for the benefit of peatlands. We are a partnership that is uh, a young but mighty. Um, we have 46 uh, Global Peatlands Initiative partners right now and um, we've really been trying to provide a dynamic uh, innovative engagement. Some of our work, as, as Tobias has mentioned, is directly to four key uh, peatland tropical peatland countries of uh, Peru, DRC, the Republic of Congo, and Indonesia. And um, we're really making some gains. But I do want to mention that the Global Peatlands Initiative founding partners, some of them were multilateral environmental agreement secretariat, such as Ramsar, um, the Convention on Biological Diversity. And we've been discussing with other MEA secretariats who are already collaborating with us on how to join. And uh, we were in the midst of discussions, uh, unfortunately had a great roadmap ahead and the pandemic um, hit. So there was a lot of adjustment and unfortunately, this cutting edge collaboration, which we had um, framed around the implementation of the United Nations Environment Assembly Resolution on peatlands got a little bit uh, put to the side and held off. Um, but I wanna just remind those that you don't, that don't know, the United Nations Environment Assembly Resolution on the conservation and sustainable management of peatlands was adopted by all member states in the world. And it's really a, a resolution that knits together and builds upon other signals and other content in other multilateral environmental agreement decisions and then takes it to another level because it is connected and interwoven. Um, those countries that signed up for this resolution, all countries in the world, really agreed that they're going to give greater emphasis to the conservation, sustainable management, and restoration of peatlands worldwide. And they have made a special request to the executive director of the United Nations Environment Program within the scope of resources that we have to really get in touch as well, building on our existing memorandum of an understanding with the Ramsar Convention, um, to coordinate efforts towards a comprehensive and accurate inventory of global peatlands. This is going to be crucial for the basis of identifying the extent of peatlands globally, determining also appropriate interventions where we look, look at connectivity, we look at these buffers, we look at what is realistic and contextualized, and also to understand the value and potential of carbon sequestration sequestration, as well as the value and potential for uh, nature, for rare and endangered species. 
and the Global Peatlands Initiative uh, Project, which is implemented by UNEP and FAO and GPI partners and others, we've started to work on this Global Peatlands Assessment. The assessment is going to be a foundation for this inventory. And uh, some of you might have seen uh, some of the session yesterday. If you didn't, you should uh, go back and watch the tab online um, because it was a really excellent and comprehensive um, session. But in a snippet, we are going to be you know, bringing together the top uh, scientists from around the world and policymakers and practitioners to um, put the state of the world's peatlands out there. Um, it will also obviously include important policy recommendations and a really deep analysis of the opportunities that the synergies between the multilateral environmental agreements, those existing mechanisms um, that we can layer up to actually advance uh, not only advance the testing of how can synergies work on the ground, but really to advance the protection, conservation, and restoration of peatlands. Um, the Global Peatlands Assessment will be a flagship product of the Global Peatlands Initiative, and it really is working very hard to, to as I said, um, fill knowledge gaps on peatland distribution, status, trends, and pressures. We certainly need to know where peatlands are so that we can also understand how they're changing. So I wanted to also share with you, which is on the Peatland Pavilion wall, for those of you that have the pleasure to be there, this global Peatlands Map 2.0, which will be the basis upon which the um, contributors and collaborators that are working in the global peatlands assessment build upon to, to validate it, to improve it and to make it uh, even more accurate and appropriate for everyone's needs. Um, I wanted to just also let you know, although the conventional migratory species was not available to join us, they hosted us in Bonn when we had a really working, a really strong working meeting between um, UNCCD, Ramsar, UNFCCC, CBD, um, CMS, and, and ourselves as UNEP and GPI. Um, we know peatlands are covering a very small portion of the world, but they are hugely important. And I really think that um, we as multilateral environmental agreements and international organizations with responsibility to help countries come along to make their goals have an opportunity here to experiment on the ground, learn as we go and work out what does it look like to implement multiple MEAs on one site at once in true harmonization. And um, so I wanted just to really welcome any other um, multilateral environmental agreements or others that are really forging ahead. Uh, someone men mentioned, of course, UNESCO, uh, UN Water, others. We are welcoming many, many partners in this really delightful but important piece. We don't have time to, you know, take a stepwise approach. Uh, we've got to do things quickly. We've got to do them dynamically. And we do have an opportunity to do this together. So UNAP and the Global Peatlands Initiative partners are here to help you. Um, we stand ready to help you through this process of engagement. Thank you so much, Tobias and others. Over back to you. Robbie, I think now we have another colleague from the Convention to Combat Desertification, Anna, uh, Jamal Anna Glitchova, who is online, I think. So please, Jamal, if you would like to share your view. Thank you very much for inviting the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. I hope you hear and see me well. We so hear you and the picture will come. Thank yes, you. great. Thank you. I'm sharing my screen. And um, right. So. Well, first of all, thank you very much again. And good evening, uh, dear participants of this site event. Thank you for inviting UNCCD. Greetings from Bonn. This is um, um, the base of the 
the headquarter of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. And indeed, for us, it's a very interesting collaboration, wetlands and drylands. So, and what are those, those two uh, ecosystem, how they are connected and what, how important are the peatlands and wetlands for UNCCD. So, and with this, I would like just to walk you through quickly, of course, through um, the main entry points and the main, uh, the common areas of, uh, of concerns and the interests of um, the UNCCD and the peatlands conservation. So first of all, first and foremost, of course, UNCCD, the main basis of collaboration and the entry points is the UNCCD strategic framework up until the period of 2030. UNCCD, um, we're working with the ecosystems. So we don't really distinguish between the ecosystem, but we're working to improve towards the improving the condition of affected ecosystem combating desertification and land degradation. And of course, what is very important for us is to achieve land degradation neutrality. Another strategic objective of UNCCD, which is guiding us for the next 10 years, is to generate global environmental benefits through the effective implementation of the convention. So as the name suggests of the convention, of course, um, Main activities of the UNCCD are limited within the drylands, but nevertheless, since UNCCD is a custodian agency of um, Sustainable Development Goal 15.3, and this brings me to another, uh, my next slide, um, the SDG um, target 15.3 is um, is um, on the achieving uh, land degradation neutrality. And this is a global, a global target and the global responsibility for UNCCD as a custodian agency. And therefore, it's really the drylands and wetlands are a part of a global ecosystem for us. And we do not really uh, limiting ourselves with these geographic and climatic zones here. And in fact, many peatlands are found within the drylands. So therefore, it is uh, also an important, um, an important ecosystem for us. So, and being a custodian agency for uh, land degradation neutrality, and the land degradation neutrality is really as a framework of achieving net zero of land degradation, is a planning um, um, and decision-making framework. So as a custodian agency for the um, land degradation neutrality, or the SDG 15.3, UNCCD helped countries to set up national uh, commitments or the national LDN targets. And as of today, 120, um, 27 countries have already developed their national LDN targets. And among them, 43 countries actually include wetlands and peatlands uh, restoration and 15 countries have the LDN direct target for no net loss of wetlands. So I think this is a very important link between and contribution of what UNCCD can do for peatland restoration. But we do not really stop on um, assisting countries in setting up the commitments and targets. We also link the targets to implementation. Um, in UNCCD, we have the operational, um, the agency operational um, structure of the convention, which helps the countries which have already set up the national targets to design uh, transformational projects. So, and so far, we do not have many requests from the countries, uh, which would include restoration of peatlands. So I think that would be one of the potential area of collaboration where we can work jointly from different MEAs uh, to help countries to uh, formulate um, transformational projects, which would be which would include the also the targets on the peatlands, so that the countries would be working and providing benefits, multiple benefits to all convention. So and we have facility for that. And just to bring you another uh, overview of the entry points of um, which we can further explore is, first of all, 
um, the part the decisions of the UNCCD. So as a as a as a treaty, of course, we're working through the decisions of the Council Conference of the Parties. And the last conference of the parties, 14, is actually was inviting parties to implement land degradation neutrality by fostering synergies among the Rio Convention and other multilateral environmental agreements. And it also requests the Secretariat and the Global Mechanism and invites UNEP to explore options for better collaboration among other major restoration and rehabilitation activities. So that we would uh, identify needs and requirements in, um, for capacities for the targeted action. So I think it, it just lays a very perfect area of collaboration and it gives us the mandate, which is very important. It gives us the mandate by this decision uh, to work jointly. Well, and as further also request the Secretariat that we enhance our reporting through the compilation of the of the um, extent and, um, and the spatial uh, information on the restoration uh, activities at the national and subnational levels. So all that, um, the decision uh, facilities and the mechanism of the UNCCD could be equally utilized for um, uh, supporting peatland restoration. And just to uh, give you an example, since I'm uh, also representing, I'm working at the uh, regional office. We're, the regional we're running office. out of time. 30 minutes, please. 30, 30 minutes. 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I just wanted to say that for uh, UNCCD, it was important to demonstrate the action on the ground, that it is a possible. So what we have about, found out, and it's actually what just Diana demonstrated on the map, is that the Central and Eastern Europe is one of the largest store of the uh, peatlands and the carbon stock. Um, so therefore, it's, it was very important for us to demonstrate, and the peatlands are highlighted in the soon-to-be-launched the report on the uh, restoration of ecosystem in Central and Eastern Europe. And finally, my last slide is just to um, showcase the example of one country, Belarus, which is for us is an illustration of success, how one country, one government can um, plan uh, the, uh, the restoration commitments of peatlands across all multilateral agreements. So, and by this, I also would like just to use the chance to say that the COP15 on GUNCCD is May next year, and drought and land restoration, including peatland and wetlands, would be on the agenda of the next COP15. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamal. I'm before we have to wrap up, I'm looking here at the people in the room. Please, Dirk Nimitz from the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Just to come back to um, some things that we heard earlier on the question with cross-ministerial um, work and how complicated it is. And I just want to, to emphasize that the processes that we are establishing in the conventions, these are your processes. This is... If we are, if you agree, if parties agree to submit data on climate change every two years to the climate change convention, it's it's a huge process and it's a lot of work and there's a lot of data you're generating, but it's data that you should not just take and drop at some focal point and they submit it to UNFCC. So data that you should talk about that you should use in order to talk to the different ministries and work with each other and how where are the synergies and how can we for this particular wetland for in the national circumstances of each country how can we make things work there so that they have benefits for different conventions and and different targets that are there so i just want to emphasize these processes are yours and make use of them in the countries and then they become useful and not only an, a reporting obligation but something that that helps you to make progress on the different conventions thank you tobias thank you. Uh, I think uh, there is a question which was uh, put on the uh, on the online. So, what are the next concrete steps for the MEAs to leverage those synergies? I think we have already heard two milestones: the CBD COP in China, the desertification COP in Cote d'Ivoire. Ramsar has just postponed its next COP to November 21, 29 next year in Wuhan, China, and I'm sure. At a similar time next year, there will be the next climate COP. So these are the milestones, but uh, is anybody still having a great idea for the last 30 seconds about uh, 
what are the next steps. I'm listening also to our four panelists online, if you want to react. Jose, Jamal, Thomas, Diana. Just one quick remark. I think um, <clears throat> we have to, to think on different levels. At the same time as the global uh, discussions are going on, you, you have to start working on the national level and on the regional level. Uh, I think we are, we are running out of time in order to wait for each other. Um, it is complex, it is complicated, but it's not, uh, it's not hopeless. So um, wherever you stand uh, on, on, on your international um, negotiations or on your national level, um, try to take the next further steps and, and work together with, on all levels at the same time. That's the only um, thing we, would, we are trying to do right now. Yeah, Diana, please, and then Jamal. So very quickly, I just would like to support what uh, Thomas just shared, is that we don't really need to wait for the decisions to be taken to start the actions, right? At the country level, at the regional level. So what the countries are um, um, uh, waiting now is also the, uh, the common platform, the exchange of ex experience on the peatlands, and also how to make the peatlands restoration profitable, how to make them attractive for business. So I think if we would try to connect countries on those topics, regional, across regionally, that would be a very good um, way to uh, pave our road to the cops and to the decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. You... Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, indeed there are opportunities. And uh, besides uh, UNEP, leading the Global Peatlands Initiative, which will indeed be available to bring all the MEAs together as you desire and as countries are asking for. Um, you, UNEP also works uh, in collaboration and on work on uh, biodiversity-related uh, synergies. So there are other colleagues that we can draw on to help us to, you know, pursue this and actually also work this out. I think definitely Jamal um, has shared a really great example of an opportunity where we can join together to uh, put together a complement, a, a large scale program that actually uh, serves the needs of, of, of our countries and looks at bringing to bear all of the expertise as well as all of the entry points available under the different uh, multilateral environmental agreements. We've done something similar in our Global Peatlands Initiative um, research working group. We've got researchers working 190. Um, we've got them working together and identifying opportunities where they complement each other across sectors, across disciplines. And I think this is something that we can definitely um, do in the future. So I'm happy and I'm very grateful as well for Ramsar as well as as the German government who's been helping us along this pathway. Thanks very much. Thank you to everybody, to the four panelists which are on screen here at Glasgow, to the panelists which are sitting next to me in the pavilion, to the audience online and here in the pavilion. Uh, I think we know the last word is that everybody, each of us has to work at his or her own level. We don't, there's no time to lose. We know the milestones which are coming up. I obviously also want to thank the Pigeon Pavilion and its organizers and our technical team who made this rather challenging online and uh, in situ uh, meeting rather successful. It has been a long day here at Glasgow. It is not finished yet, but uh, it, I wish everybody of us a lot of enthusiasm and uh, We'll meet again very soon in whatever way and with whatever framework. Thanks for all your contributions. Bye-bye.